Tonight, is Iron Maiden a secret Christian band? Our discussion of a matter of life and death is one you won't want to miss. Podcast them down, Iron Maiden, after this. Podcast them down! Hail Metal Nation, it is we, Tim, Matt, and Doug, and we are continuing Iron Maiden 2023 by reviewing the entire Iron Maiden discography. So at this point, we have made it all the way to A Matter of Loaf and Death, a fantastic movie by Ardman Studios. No, 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 that, that's that, life and death, a matter life, of life and death. Loaf, loaf and death. No, 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 no. That's 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 a that's a, a okay, well, claymation <laughs> claymation thing. So they had nothing to do with like Wallace and Gromit and all that. No, no, they did not. Okay, I'm gonna. Although, have to, I'm gonna have to lower my score then. <laughs> although I I will say that this album and a matter of loaf and death are roughly contemporaneous. So, I mean, this is the closest Iron Maiden album to that BAFTA award-winning film. <laughs> I don't know. The Final Frontier kind of. You know, that's like a, a grand day out, I guess. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> which, which which I believe will also cover in this one. Grand day well, out, yeah. also better than Final Frontier. And well, there is a hot air balloon um, for the Book of Souls later on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> like Are they secretly Wallace and Gromit? Or... <laughs> they might be. It's like their stupid albums are more memorable. So I really had to listen to this one a lot. Mm, mm-hmm. Oh, uh, which, which is not actually a criticism. Uh, but all right, why don't we start with a cover? Uh, it's, it's actually uh, good. Um, this guy, I forget his name. He's only done one album cover, this one. Uh, he's a comic book artist, and he's from Prince George's County. What? Oh, really? His name is Hello. Tim, Tim Bradstreet, best known for his work on the Hellblazer and Punisher comics. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I love this cover. Uh, I, I bought a poster for, of this cover at Hot Topic in 2006. Whoa. Up the irons. Uh, uh, up the arms. Up the arms. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, so the things that don't hold up uh, a little bit is some of the digital coloring, which was not the artist in the artist. Yeah, this was uh, still 2006. <laughs> yeah. You know? But you know what? This is like very much. If you told me this was the poster for some, uh, you know, like, uh, what were all those combat simulation video games that were hot between, like, 2005 and 2015? Like, if this is some, like, zombie mode in Battlefield or, you know, something like that, I'd be like, okay, that makes sense. It's contemporaneous. I definitely remember seeing, so so it's a tank firing above you, I guess, with uh, zombies Mm -hmm. marching towards you, and then there's a pirate-looking flag, but instead of a skull and crossbones, it's Eddie with a helmet, and instead of crossbones, it's uh, two machine guns. Yeah. I mean, one criticism besides the color, I'll forgive the coloring uh, aspect, but I do think Eddie is so subdued and his face is so small that you really have to squint to realize that that's Eddie and not just some other random zombie soldier. Guy. Yeah, but I think a lot of the rest of the uh, I remember promotions for this album had that everywhere. So like, uh, didn't the album come with a sticker or a patch or something like? Maybe. Yeah, it came with a patch of the the two guns crossed and. Not to get excessively pedantic, because I do get what they're going for, but it has bothered me for 15 years that the clip is in a in a place in the gun where it would never actually function, just the way a gun works. Oh yeah, look at look at that. That's not how that works at all. And I know that's like probably even their arguably their point, but uh, it's still stupid. <laughs> but yeah, what, what's this guy's name? Uh, it is. Tim Bradstreet. Tim, Tim Bradstreet. Brad Tim Bradstreet. Brad <laughs> I'm gonna. Tim I'm Brad gonna. Well, I'm gonna but, delete you trying to talk over me. <laughs> let's try and get him on the podcast. Talk, yeah. reminisce about the Landover Mall bit. We'll say, oh, he's from Chevrolet. Do you remember Landover? 
<laughs> we can Podcast talk to him about- down. The only podcast in which you're more likely to hear discussion of the Landover Mall than the new kill switch engage. <laughs> I uh, I pulled up his uh, his Wikipedia here, and he he looks like some dude from PG County. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could see him hanging out in Cloverly. Oh, he's he's done all sorts of stuff. Uh, you've heard of. And very little music, which is interesting. I wonder how they even found him. And he seems to be a cover artist, which makes sense, more than like an interior artist, um, which also fits with kind of the style of the of the uh, album cover here. Yeah, and oh, if, if you look at the original, like, original submission of this without the coloring, you can see, like, he's got a very... Um, well, I mean, it's pen and ink. Of course, it's a monochromatic style, but very like, uh, I, I call it kind of Xerox, but not in a bad way. Mm-hmm. Very contrasty. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but realistic. Wait a minute. Hold on. He, he does the Star Trek comics from 2011. <gasps> Number one Ooh. through ongoing. Oh, those have got to be Kelvinverse <laughs> comics, Doug. He's he's done the 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 covers for those. Oh, we gotta well. get this. Guy. We have to get him so bad now. Well, he's a short drive away. <laughs> Assuming he still lives there. Beautiful Chevrolet. It is beautiful, actually. <laughs> All <is>. right. <laughs> I like how you have to clarify. All right, so, um, uh, matter of life and death. Uh, do we? Do we care about the the history leading up to this part? Um, I think we should, just for consistency's sake. Yeah, so they toured for Dance of Death. Um, they uh, they started working on A Matter of Life and Death at the end of 2005, which is their 14th studio album. It was released Ooh. in 2006. Not a concept album, but... War and religion are recurring themes in the lyrics as well as the cover artwork. Oh, Merely according conceptual. To this, well, yeah. where's, yeah. The, where's the religion on the cover artwork? Uh, okay. oh. The resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Oh, and brains, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, and then... Almost um, on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the tour... Following this, uh, they played the whole album live. <laughs> I so, have to say, I really do respect that. I, I do like it when these old bit because I hate when these bands release a viable record and then play two songs and then just give you what you want. Yeah, well, Not getting what you want is part of the metal experience. Well, so, okay. that big, pendulum you. swung because when they finished that tour, they immediately turned around and did the Somewhere Back in Time World tour. <laughs> yeah, that was well, a great one. You know, you you need to have your passion projects. You need to do something for yourself, and then you need to pay for your passion projects. So I I, I don't necessarily blame them for that entirely. And I, I would say this is, uh, it's kind of the X Factor part two a little bit. It's like the X Factor, but good. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think if, if you remember back to some of our reviews of the past four albums since uh, 10 and 11, um, we kept saying, like, maybe there's a good song here. Maybe there's a good song here. I feel like maybe there was some kind of screen or net, and somehow all the, all the, Better songs kept falling through the cracks, and they just collected here, uh, like by bycatch or something. Well, it, it certainly helps, I think, that Adrian Smith's name's on 60% of the songs, and <laughs> yeah, Bruce right. Dickinson's on 50%. Then uh, Steve Harris only has one writing, one sole, sole writing credit, and it's for the longest fucking song on here. <laughs> so, by <laughs> three seconds. I wonder seconds. what that could be. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, quick, uh, run through the track list, then we'll go back through and talk about it. It's a different world. These colors don't run brighter than a thousand suns. The pilgrim, the longest day, which you would expect to be <laughs> most days. You have to listen to New Iron Maiden. Um, out of the shadows, the reincarnation of Benjamin Brieg for the greater good of God, Lord of Light, 
and the legacy total length 71 minutes 53 seconds uh, i came with a limited edition dvd is that Ooh. what you have there yeah yeah you have it so yes. it has a half hour making of uh, matter of life and death as the music video for the reincarnation of Benjamin Brieg and uh, studio performance, a uh, footage of a different world, and then a photo gallery, which you know, no one watches the photo gallery, no but it's on there. The photo gallery. Uh, same lineup as before. Yeah, the, the and and throughout the rest of the albums we're going to look at, it's been this lineup. Um, Steve Harris on keyboards yeah and uh kevin Sherwe is the producer again yep this is the obligatory time where one of us says this album it sounds better than the other ones then someone says the production ruins this album and then someone says (laughs) kevin shirley's got to go so i don't know who's what this time Uh, i'm gonna be the 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 production sounds a lot better on this one Uh, i think i'll pick that one yeah, I believe they, uh, I, I'm going to go with, um, well, an interesting, I'm sure you, you were going to say this, Tim, but an interesting fact, they didn't master the record. So bring your own equalizer. But you don't have Steve yeah. Harris's setup. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's funny because two years later, you know, Metallica made up for it by overmastering their album yep. and just brick walling <laughs> the motherfuckers. <laughs> yep. Um, Maybe they were I, listening to this album and, and Lars was like, all right, one thing we can't do is do what Iron Maiden did and need some very specific equalizer settings. You know, I, I've i listened to this album, this this listen through off of my, my which I can't get on camera, my, my Walkmans, which uh, I believe I talked about <laughs> in, a, in an early podcast and down. Maybe and it does did. play flack, but I have this album on MP3 because I don't want it uh, clogging up my uh, hard drive space. <laughs> Not worth the bits. <laughs> but now, but yeah, I totally forgot it wasn't mastered, which uh, might give you a more um, a better sound image if you listen to it on a high quality stereo in mm. flack, in lossless, or on Apple Music. Not a sponsor. <laughs> well. I would say, you know, part of contemporary metal does involve typically fairly aggressive production, uh, which this album doesn't have. This, I mean, I think all of the, the part of the dynamic of the last six records has been recording live together. Uh, I'm sure mm. fixing it. Um, and this, this genuinely sounds close to live in the studio, which was their aim. I should also, before we move on, uh, we mentioned Apple Music, and I should not have made the switch to Apple Music uh, in the middle of Iron Maiden, because now the Apple algorithm thinks I'm a dopey Iron Maiden super fan and is just recommending that I Aww. listen to atrocious things. <laughs> hey, have you heard No Prayer for the Dying? Oh, do you like... uh Synthy garbagey songs that are 19 minutes long. Well, here you go. I'm Apple Music. Uh, it sounds oh, a lot like new Santa. Alan Parsons Why? project. And so, uh, like apparently, Jefferson Starship Matthew. Apparently, most of the uh, final takes were the first takes <laughs> on the album. Right. Uh, well, that's Steve Harris so says that cool. it is heavier than we've ever been, but also very progressive. And I don't mean that in the modern sense, but like Dream Theater. More in a 70s uh, way. I can't... Isn't, okay, uh, isn't Dream Theater like the epitome of modern progressive yeah, yeah. So metal? He said he doesn't mean that in the modern sense, but like Dream Theater, more in a 70s way. Maybe that's a typo. Maybe here. he meant in a modern sense like Dream Theater. Although, uh, not this record in particular, um, but coming soon... There's a lot of bad dream theater inspired garbage. Uh, not that I love dream theater, but if you're not as talented as the gentleman of dream theater <laughs> and try to do that, you might produce uh, several albums that we'll speak about later. Yeah, like yeah, if well, you only use three keys on your keyboard. Yeah. Like if you bought a keyboard, but never learned how to play it or maybe like, 
borrowed someone's Steinway, but only know how to bleak, bleak, All bleak. I know is... But that's later. That's for later. All I know is if you describe Iron Maiden as progressive, uh, you know, add that to the list of bands that just mean you don't know what the word progressive means. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Especially if you're in said band. <laughs> All right, so so we open with a different world, which the standard commercial opener. I'm not going to bash it. I do think this is their weakest one of these to date, but it's fine. It's it's fine. It's, I agree. It's, it's fine. I I didn't really get the whole like uh, Hillman College aspect of it. Like I thought the lyrics could have been a little more relevant to the show that inspired it. Um, but. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, it's it's fine. It's a, it's a, you know it got it got young Doug into hot topic to buy this poster. So you know That's we true. can't <laughs> we can't judge it that harshly. Sure, it had an amazing animated video that I saw once and forgot about. Uh, all right. So this color, th- these colors don't run, which is uh, the first good to great song uh, yeah, on this I, record. I wouldn't go so far as great. Like it's it's. I'm going to be saying this over and over and over again. It would be good if they tightened it up. It just overstays its welcome. Oh, well, I I think that's a fair point on almost every song. We will talk about any song longer than six minutes. Yeah. You could take the first minute off and probably the last minute too. And the song would be better. Yep. Like just across the board. Uh, well, and, and we'll return to this theme because it, it's, uh, it's spreading and catching and getting, Chronic, but, but yeah, it's, it's a, uh, oh. a, a, a fairly uh, a, a obvious, but I would say observant song on the uh, notions of nationalism and uh, and war. It's got a great chorus, uh, really good track too. Uh, then we get into what's maybe a bit of a controversial song, and just a if you look at metal archives or anywhere where people rank the songs mm. on all of these records going forward, they're all over the place. Like, yeah, I, I would say most people would agree that, uh, back in the village is the weak song on power slave, whether you like it or not. Uh, but there are no like, weak songs and people power list slave. every song with about equivalence going forward. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is a what eight nine minute song about the development of the atom bomb. Now, uh, there was I want to see when it was because uh, Lincoln Park did the exact same thing, but as a concept album, and I want to figure out who ripped off whom. Um, it's literally called "A Thousand Suns," uh, and it came out in 2010. Okay, so. Maybe this inspired the the best thing Lincoln Park ever did. That's not saying much, but um, you know, I, I, it's it's fine. I I wish there was a little more lyrical and musical tension in it, because because for something that should be about a dilemma or tension or kind of like moral psychological struggle it's just kind of a muddy song with yeah I, I, and the uh, the chorus is highly repetitive yeah uh not the worst example but it is repetitive and i do oh it's good. chain letters of satan <laughs> yeah 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 and this um, is a problem i have in general with with Iron Maiden taking on serious topics and kind of their, I guess this is the third act of their career. Um, You know, in the beginning, they were just kind of funny and frivolous, but they had a deeper meaning. But, but now I think this is a good example of a song that takes itself too seriously, but they also don't have the lyrical prowess to do a serious song. So it just seems strangely flippant and glib. Uh, when it yeah. could Perfect be a example, very... E equals MC squared has nothing to do with the atomic bomb. <laughs> yeah. I mean, only in the vaguest of sense. It's like, well, that's a... Hey, but I, that's a science thing, ain't it? And, and it's like... <laughs> 
Well, I think so, Steve. (laughs) (laughs) Oi. When Einstein invented the atomic bomb, I believe he said the following. (laughs) You know, them chain letters of Satan. (laughs) That cold fused fission and fury. Uh, Anyway. Yeah, so I, I agree, and it's it, it doesn't, uh, and I think uh, Matt will be on exactly the same page on the uh, balloon songs lyrics. Oh my god! Oh. I would say really suffers from that, but I'm yeah, not going to yeah. steal your thunder. No, oh, uh, I can't wait the, for this. Oh my god! Then we get to the Pilgrim, which I actually think is a great song. Uh, it's it's good. I mean. I, I, listening to again, I hadn't listened to this album in many, many years, uh, and I got like the nervous feeling in the pit of my stomach listening to "Brighter Than a Thousand Suns" because I was like, "This is slipping a little bit," and I was expecting this to just be a muddled, like fumble. But it's it's good. The pace is good. It's a different pace. It feels fresh. It sounds like Iron Maiden. Um, it's not a perfect song. It's not an amazing song, but it's not an awful song. And for, for five minutes, seven seconds, you got that kind of bounciness, the yeah. Middle Eastern thing. And I do think it captures the religious persecution that, uh, I mean, that they, it's kind of generic. It's really about the pilgrims leaving England and coming to America, but doesn't want to just say that, even though. Oh, did they skip uh, it? It's exactly they that. Skip the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Fucking they, Nederlanders. Songs five minutes long. They still managed to do the chorus four times. <laughs> hey, but comparatively, <laughs> like, that's pretty good. <laughs> and then we get the uh, longest day. Uh, longest day. Which is uh, D Day. Um, I thought it was the day I listened to the Book of Souls. <laughs> oh man, I'm uh, too slow on the. I, I'm probably thing. a sucker. I like all of their Second World War songs, just kind of automatically. Unfortunately, <laughs> this is fine. There we go. That was for uh, you. That was for you. Uh, I did, there is a uh, Iron Maiden doesn't do this super much, but they do kind of use, and there's probably a fancy musical term for this, but the uh, using the instrumentation to replicate sounds in the experience so like you get percussive beats that sound like um artillery yeah i I like that i mean that's i mean it's again it's not an innovation um but it's it's a good use of that technique um i like that it's not bad i mean again it's it's a nice if if you're coming to this album looking for like songs you will be singing all day you will not really find those here. Um, yes. But but every song, you know, every song is good enough that you won't be like looking at the length, wondering how long is left, like just trying to hit the skip button. Like if if you're if you're taking a f- five hour drive and and this album comes up at hour two, you'll listen to the whole album no problem. Yeah, and th- this song is nearly eight minutes long and, and works at that yeah. length. So. It does not feel eight minutes long at all. It just kind of moves along. You're like, okay. And I, I, the lyrics hold up, generally speaking. They don't, it doesn't feel comic booky in the wrong way. Uh, exactly. Then we get to Out of the Shadows, which sucks. I'd say this is the only <laughs> weak song on here. Uh, if you like pseudo power ballads that go nowhere, uh, sure. And, and, and there's just like a, a flatness to it. It's yeah, like, and, and there's no the, yeah. the chorus isn't catchy, and it you know acoustic acoustic build, but yeah, it stays flat. It never crescendos. Yeah, it never really gets anywhere. And then we get this is an interesting one: the reincarnation of Benjamin Brig. Um, now, now, this is just someone they totally made up, right? Like, should I know who Benjamin Brig is? They did, and I guess this was fashionable around this time. I forget the the pretentious term for it, but an, I guess I think it was alternative reality game 
where they oh, made a website uh, about Benjamin Brieg and like seeded some things and knew their fans would run out and discover all this stuff. Uh, so uh, yeah. Blair Witch. <laughs> yeah, he has a fictional biography. Um, okay, he did some. I go look it up. Uh, this this was a single the audience. The the single has a uh, Eddie digging out the grave of. Benjamin Brieg with a pickaxe, though. I feel like that's a that's a more awful way to yeah, dig up a grave. It's gonna be a long fucking night. <laughs> <laughs> I this is a this would be a really good sort of catchy single if they took the first two minutes off. Right. Not to go back to that, but like this is very it sounds like Dio Sabbath to me. <sighs> Well, this is the beginning of what I like to call the Final Frontier Syndrome. This is the first incident of it, where there is a good song here, just squashed uh, and packaged, if you will, in just garbage. Um, <laughs> and 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 I wish, I wish, you know, some more conceptual bands will will have like a weird interlude thing that you can skip and get to the good part of the song. And I just wish if they had this innovation, it's like, yes, okay, I don't know why, but for some reason you really like this like ethereal, forever long, sing-songy intro. Okay, do that if you want. Be true to your heart, be true to your vision. But let me skip it, because that is not good. <laughs> yeah, it, and I think there's some version of it that is only five minutes long, but apparently they couldn't they released this as a single, but it's not officially a single because it's the song is too long. Right. Right. Yeah. So if you can't release a single as a single, you'd think you'd step back and ask like they, they managed oh. to make the angel and the gambler four minutes. Like, like, like why would you ever release an 18 minute goddamn song as a single? Because, because it's not, I okay, sorry. All right. We're not, not there yet. We're not there yet. One college prog prog college show will play it somewhere. Uh, all right, then we get to the greater good of God, or for the greater good of God, which is a um, a song about religion and war, and then about Jesus dying for all of us, mm -hmm. whether we like it or appreciate it or not. And that part is very metal. That, <laughs> the metal Christianity, <laughs> and if that yes, wasn't the, tedious the, enough, the built-in <laughs> resentment. It's like yeah, that the day, message like that wasn't song about how God loves you, yeah. whether you love Him or not. Yeah, after the message wasn't tedious enough, the the music makes up for it. <laughs> I I actually like this song. I don't like the chorus said ten thousand times. So I do like the way the of God is kind of delivered. I don't know the technical way, but kind of like it. the song dips, then he just, of God. Like, I think it's quite a separate breath, but like the chorus crescendos, and then he has to get of God in there. For the greater good of God. Oh God. <laughs> I, I know someone, I don't know who, but I know one of the members of Iron Maiden is very religious. And is it Nico oh, it's McBain. Nico McBain. Okay, so I was wondering if he had some influence on the song, but it just says Steve Harris in the in the credits. Hey, you know, Dream Theater did the song way better when they called it "In the Name of God." <laughs> uh, they did. They did. Well, same you know, subject, but way hey, better. <laughs> look, they're not progressive. Okay, they're not like Dream Theater. Oh wait, are they? They are like. Oh <laughs> I, fuck! I forget. Okay, okay I don't remember. Well, I, I will say for a nine-minute song, this one basically works. Disagree. Hard disagree. <laughs> I, I, I'm somewhere in between uh, Tim and Doug. I, I don't mind this song. I, I, I don't think it has this editing problem that, say, um, the reincarnation of Benjamin Brieg or the entire next two albums have. But I do think uh, that it's... It, I, again, it, it is... It is a good eighth track, right? It's uh, bringing you to the close. Uh, it's not essential listening. It's for your completest, but it's not. It's not bad. Yeah, and I, I think um, this is another one. I mean, this there is 
50 to 60 minutes of good to great material on here. And this is, I think we'll agree, a pretty strong record, but you take a song out and then scoop out some stuff from three other tracks, you have a Mm -hmm. good to great record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just it just needed some... Is it something about bands when they become institutions that they just either don't feel the need to or or record people like the record companies don't have kind of the guts to edit them it's it's just I, it's strange and the I, the I the tell to me is always when they start producing their own music which mm-hmm. i from the outside looking in seems always feels like a bad idea you yeah. may think you know your sound from three records ago, but you're never going to be able to evolve it effectively yourself, typically. And in yeah, this and case, they, they've totally co-opted their producer. Yeah, you need that, cri- you need a criticism, you need a, a friendly enemy to help you produce great work rather than just like, well, I think it looks good, Bruce. Yeah, it sounds great. I th- you know, it's the million different crazy things you'll hear about Rick Rubin uh, but you you look at what he's bands actually record with him. He brings in terrible engineers every time and doesn't seem to do anything but talk to the band when he shows up. But somehow they uh, almost always release a better record. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Lord uh, of Light, not bad song. I, I of, love this song. Yeah, uh, yeah. Great dynamics. It's actually kind of about redeeming Lucifer. Yeah, I I feel like it's a better weird end of the album religious song than the one that immediately precedes it. Um, like in my fantasy world, like this song is track eight, and there's only nine tracks, and it's fine. It's great. <laughs> yeah, well, they, we could just put the line about Jesus in one of the other songs. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I was like the legacy of Jesus. I was yeah. digging through the uh, <laughs> the reviews on Metal Archives for this album, looking for someone to complain about the re- the religious message. <clears throat> Couldn't really find anything, <laughs> but what are the reviews? 34%. When Steve Harris turned into George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I'm going to save the rest of the, the uh, what I was going to quote here <laughs> for oh. a wrap up of the album. <laughs> Oh, I'm so <laughs> because it sums now. up my thoughts perfectly. <laughs> oh no! All right, I go can't ahead. wait. <laughs> but then we get the the legacy again. Another nine minute one. Mm-hmm. I actually do like this song. I think it's got a good build to it, uh, and I think the lyrics mm-hmm. are kind of evocative and almost justify, almost take it to the point where they'll it works for nine minutes. Yeah, I, I, and, and this is one of the few times that they pull this off. Because here the slow kind of build followed by kind of the mid song tempo dynamic style change, like the build works. Um, Again, this isn't going in my top 20 songs, but I feel like it's a good album closer. It's a solid album closer. It's the most satisfying ending to an album since when I can't even remember a decent Iron Maiden album, definitely since like 1992 or something, right? Um, So they got the landing right. That's Um, true. And I love how the, um, I don't know the technical term, Tim, but the way they they want you to know that they recorded all the acoustic guitar parts live and you can hear the uh, reverb, but you know, the at the end. I think they unintentionally did that on Shen (laughs) Jetsu. Yeah, they definitely did unintentionally do that. I, I don't know if there is a term for that. They just, they left it. They didn't polish it. Yeah, and it's like, I'm sure Bruce, Bruce Dick is like the bounce on the piano. And I do love that, except when it's obvious you're including it to show that you're playing on a true fucking piano. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, All right. I have an interesting tidbit about the balloon song when we get there. <laughs> oh yes, I cannot wait. <sighs> well, Look, we covered it all. What's your quote, Tim? There are people whose response to this is Trooper Ed, by the way. So this guy loves Iron Maiden. Oh no. <laughs> 
uh, there are people whose response to criticism of a matter of life and death is, what do you want them to do? <laughs> Keep rewriting the trooper? Well, if the alternative is Steve rewriting Fear of the Dark for 25 fucking years, which is what this album is, then yes, shut up and rewrite the trooper. <laughs> I don't think this is as bad as rewriting Fear of the Dark. I think no. everything that follows it is as bad as rewriting Fear of the Dark, if not worse. But uh, in, in all fairness, this is rewriting the X Factor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with with greater uh, effect. Yeah. As as counterpoint, I would like to read you a portion of. Uh, Frost of the Blacks, uh, July 9th, 2007 review on Metal Archives. Yep. Iron Maiden's best album ever, 99%. Why is this album so good? It excels on every level on which Iron Maiden is expected. I analyzed it in terms of production, vocals, drum, bass, guitars, and songwriting. <laughs> and all of those elements, great. I made the controversial statement that this is Maiden's best. Go out and buy it and give it a few months of listening. Oh. Maybe you'll agree. It's hard to deny, though, that this is an excellent heavy metal release. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, well, there. I, I, yeah, I don't like to uh, to pick on people who don't know English as a first language, but you'll feel, see all sorts of cynical Iron Maiden fans that just say they do the <laughs> No More Lies or Blood Brothers so they can play that in South America and everyone feels like they know it. No, I I don't buy that because uh, Man of War is... They do that. Yeah. And, and yeah. what they do specifically is uh make a song out of song titles again and again and again no they have like i think if you analyze we should we should do a study if you the 50 words they use yeah if you analyze the reading level of each of of each band i think man of war would be way down because they just use the same words over and over again <laughs> like if, if feel we like, got a lexicological study <laughs> yeah and i feel like that that is intended for people who aren't because the the songwriting of the first few albums like get the the lyric writing of the first few man of war albums like decreases in complexity and i, I think mean, they're trying to hit that sweet spot to get uh english as a third or fourth language Jim, although I, recalling man of war's history could it just be that the only literate member of the band left it could also be <laughs> So uh, I ha I do have another quote for you from, from the same review I quoted before. Finally, and I realize this is petty and slightly non-musical, but I'm taking at least 20 points off. <laughs> 20 points? Yeah, so it went down from 54 to 34. For the worst decision this band has made since choosing Blaze Bailey as a lead vocalist, playing the entire album live. Fuck you. Quote, oh, we're absolutely in love with this album we gave birth to. We can't possibly omit any of it live. Not your decision to make. That is a decision that can only be made when rabid fan reaction demands it. What's especially funny is the usual tradition of Maiden releasing a live album for the tour of the most recent album, usually containing a few tracks from the album in question. A perfectly reasonable gesture. But even 10 years later, a live album from the store has yet to surface. I can only imagine the reason is because Rod came to the same conclusion I did. There is absolutely nothing wrong with playing a serviceable helping of new material live, just as long as it doesn't suck monkey dick. Ah! <laughs> uh, I disagree right, with, with that, too, but... The I love the just view. A, it's a great poet and a scholar. As, as, yeah. a, as a palate cleanser, here's another counterpoint from, uh, from the 99% review. Nico <laughs> is not the fastest or most technically skilled drummer in metal, but he doesn't need to be. Just listen to the beat he creates with the China symbol in the Pilgrim at about 1 minute 37 seconds. It's absolutely brilliant. Something that will stick out to you even after the album is over. Do, do you remember 
the China symbol beat? Error. I'm gonna. God. Yeah. Well, I, I won't play it in the podcast, but I'll, I'll bring it up so I can I can evaluate it live. I'll tell you when I get there. Okay. But in the meantime, there's a great <laughs> there's a great Metallica quote. It said Lars isn't the best drummer. And James says, Lars isn't even the best drummer in Metallica. Ah! <laughs> That's All right, waiting, waiting. It's, it's going to stick with you forever. Be careful. I don't hear a China symbol. I, hear, I, 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 don't hear, I got I to the tempo change. Uh-huh. Okay. I just, I feel like. What? All he does is hit the downbeats with the China symbol. Who fucking yeah. cares? This guy's a moron. <laughs> the, I, I just the, the reviewer, it. not Nico McBrain. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like you have to go to school to write on metal archives, and everyone writes in the same, uh, b- both blunt, somehow blunt, crass, and pretentious style. <laughs> <laughs> All right, matter of life and death what? suppose perhaps a before and after in Maiden's Neo discography in fact Steve Harris considers Brave New World and Omelad the two masterpieces of the band since 2000 however I'm in dissonance with him since Dance of Death must be included it would be a trilogy in any case a matter of life and death is an album to sit on the sofa with an evening coffee so you could contemplate each of its nuances and guitar layers in the course of dusk. That's poor with sleep an, hygiene. Having yeah, coffee. with an evening coffee? We don't recommend this, especially no, if you're having sleep problems. Yeah. Well, that's why you're having sleep problems. <laughs> uh, and I do this guy, he proves me wrong. And, uh, well, he doesn't say where he's from, but, uh, since I'm a Latino fan, something curious I had to experience is that many people around me who are not metalheads have come to say that Maiden has a, a romantic style. And they say it for songs like Different World, No More Lies, and several from Brave New World. I don't really know what they want to say with romantic style. This has nothing to do with the lyrics. Maybe the vocal patterns of Bruce Dickinson since Brave New World. Okay, I'm not. Yes. <laughs> I, feel, I love every person who writes on metal archives. Thank I feel you. like the vast majority of them put on like, you, you know, like when Homer on the Simpsons reads something and he pulls out his reading glasses, you know, <laughs> they do that. And then they get like a pipe and they're like, I'm in dissonance with this. <laughs> okay. Well, then you get the, uh, I'm still in that very small group of people who hate this album. I remember when the damn album was released. I listened once and refused to listen to it again. Well, 15 years later, I did the same, and it didn't I grow read this on review. me again. I read this review. Oh, my God. <laughs> if this paradigm of their turbulent era was already marked by random luck, this album finally broke the unity and cohesion, which painted true dark paradigm, panorama unity, itself, cohesion. but not in a good way. I'm, I'm digging on the buzzwords. <laughs> yeah. I love okay, uh, so much. let's throw a number on on uh, on this album. Eight. Uh, I was gonna say seven. Uh, I'm happy with eight. Well, uh, I gotta bring it down. Okay. Uh, it's better than but Fear need, of the Dark. I'm not. I'm not like that need, guy who says they keep rewriting Fear of the Dark. So I would say four and a half. So four and a half. <laughs> you got a seven and an eight and a four and a half. Well, yeah, because I'd rather listen to No Prayer for the Dying, to be honest. Uh, okay. So let's right, see. Where did, where did where did we put Brave New World? Brave New World is a six, so you want to put it above that, I assume. This, this is yeah, better eight, than seven a Brave and four New and World. Half probably lands at six and a half or seven, right? I say I think seven is right. It's it's one better than a Brave New World. Well, you're sure. wrong. It's six and a half. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> Which ties it with somewhere in time. Does that make you feel better? That's that's fine. I mean. Just enjoy our time on this side of five for a while. Oh, on this side of three for a while. <laughs> All right. Uh, so one, two, the final frontier. Final okay. frontier. Oh, did you the know? Final frontier. <laughs> so the final what? frontier. See, I really remember this record because it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting a lot of. Now, now that. Uh, 
you know, we broke it out. It's getting used a lot. So they did their somewhere back in time tour. <clears throat> then they did, um, let's see the, uh, they did uh flight six, six, six. That's Iron right. Yeah. Iron Maiden flight six, six, six. And then after that, they He's flying the plane. <gasps> <gasps> they announced <laughs> that, uh, early in 2010, they would uh, meet up with Kevin Shirley again and do Final Frontier, announced on March 4th, three singles, Frontier El Dorado coming home, as well as epic progressive opuses such as Isle of Avalon, The Talisman, and Where the Wild Wind Blows. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so they, they did 101 shows in support of this <sighs> album, and... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's all just like they they stop being interesting things to say. So like these things are just like they they went on tour for it. So the final frontier apparently at some point Steve Harris said we're gonna stop at fifteen albums, right? Yeah, that 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 was the point, right? <laughs> well, so they chose the final frontier to fuck with the fans. because <laughs> uh. I I guess it was like uh, the. You know, Kiss's farewell tour. <laughs> it's like, oh, we're oh not okay. You know, well, and I we but that's all what they saw say them now. together. That's, that is yeah. what they say now. We, we were went to we the were show all at together Nissan. at the show. Uh, good show and a, a grand old time in that parking lot for three hours. Mm -hmm. That might mm -hmm. be the last time I went there. I, I think I was there one time later. We are talking about, by the way, a. Uh, a um, venue west of D.C. that's awful. And the only people who like going to it already live west of D.C. <laughs> or yeah. south of D.C. If, if you, you live in the north field, of D.C., it's just never fucking of. miserable to get to and come back from. If you live in Woodbridge, you're a butt size when a band butt is coming sized. through Jiffy Loop. <laughs> oh, man, that's another, that's another dang Take butt Jeff sized. Davis Highway <laughs> over to the Jiffy Loop live. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I there's too much traffic on the Jeff Davis. Go on the John Mosby. <laughs> no, I still call it Nissan Pavilion. <laughs> I know, I know yeah. you do. I know you do. That also makes uh, the town smaller than it is. <laughs> well, what I really enjoy about these uh, these first four Maiden records is they go from like the band trying to present as mature to just crass comic book shit again yeah so this this is like dance of death part two we get this very mm -hmm. uh comic booky violent cover actually reminds me of a doctor who episode yes, yes. so it's an it's alien it's like a um, christopher eccleston series episode what is he holding exactly it's like some the, kind of power key or I, Something. I was the way and, he's holding it looks like a mini. What? <laughs> Th this is actually cool. So the Final Frontier video, and we'll put leave the song aside for a second. But uh, it's this space explorer being chased by another spaceship, who turns out to be piloted by Eddie. And the MacGuffin of the video is that key. Oh, okay. Mm. It, lo it looks like a tiny hammer. Or tiny yeah. axe that he's using to bash open these aliens' spacesuits with. Yeah, oh, it's supposed like a, to be humans. I they're, think those are supposed to be humans, but their teeth maybe they're exploded. mutated. Uh, maybe they're maybe they're these zombie soldiers from Matter of Life and Death. Oh, you know, <laughs> it could be it could be in the uh, Planet of the Apes timeline. So those could be like <laughs> chimpanzee skulls. Oh, okay. So uh, for yeah, this they, one, they look like the um, the silence in the library. I think that's the Doctor Who episode. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I so this one, they went back to Compass Point Studios in Nassau, Bahamas. Uh, the last time they were there was the 1980s, and uh, Dickinson remarked the studio had the same vibe and was exactly as it had been in 1983. Uh -oh. Nothing had changed, even down to the broken shutter in the corner, same carpet, everything. It was really quite spooky, but we felt very relaxed in such a familiar and well-trodden environment. I think the shows in the playing and the atmosphere of the album. Um, 
So I guess they tracked in the Bahamas and then they, you know, I guess they had to save money. So they moved it all to Malibu (laughs) where they uh, mixed it and did some additional vocals. And I wonder if any of the guitarists were there during that second session, because they seem to have told them all to take five. And well, it's funny. This is, this is the lead bass. It's funny. You bring that up because Bruce, Quote, Bruce Dickinson, this is Kevin Shirley, uh, Bruce mm-hmm. Dickinson flew in for a few days and sang all his parts before flying off to the four corners of the globe. And Steve Harris stayed behind to finish the record with me. He's pretty hands on like that. Adrian uh. Smith, guitarist, dropped in from time to time to hear stuff. And like in any band, not everyone has the same end result in mind, but we get there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, Steve, don't, don't you think you're bass is overpowering the guitar solos no 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 i think it's fine five songs so no, it's if, fine if you don't have a reason yet to hate this album or or are searching for a reason to hate this album steve harris has a writing credit on every single song and the album closer 11 minutes long called when the wild mm-hmm. wind blows that's the only song that's solely credited to him mm-hmm. <laughs> but i i one thing this is more praise for the next two records, but it's at this point that the records start to sound more metal, like the guitar tone and the overall production. Okay. Um, uh, and there's a lot of problems with the guitars in this record, but uh, like El Dorado and all sound like metal songs, not dad rock. <laughs> okay, that's true. Um, so we open with Satellite 15, and I'm going to immediately disagree with Matt, uh, because I love this song. It's such a great fuck you. The uh, the five minutes of of noise and, like, lost in no. space control. Okay? Space like, noise. Woo! Space noise. Wow. This does not, this opening track does not sound like an Iron Maiden song. It's just kind of, like, there's, most of it, there's no, like, drum beat. <laughs> You know, it's just like da 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 da, and then just a lot of like floaty shit. (laughs) I'm actually great. I'm just saying it doesn't sound like Maiden. I'm gonna have to play a metal card here uh, because Doug, I also love Satellite Fifteen. It's the it's it's the I, I I love how isolated it makes me feel i feel like i'm going insane and the one problem i hate this entire album i wish the masters were burned in a fire but when i hear the final frontier repeated 19 20 times back to back to back to back i sing it for days i have been singing and the guitar riff since last thursday (laughs) well and, and uh, uh, check out Patreon when we watch the video. Yep. This is the last video they tried, in, I, if I recall. And I'm going to say I it right wanna, here. Satellite I, 15, best Iron Maiden song. No, I need yeah, to it, finish my thought here because halfway through this song, it stops being a Devin Townsend song and then immediately changes abruptly to new shitty Iron Maiden. Oh, it's so great. It's no, it's amazing. not. It's great until it sounds like Iron Maiden again. But that's the ultimate fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 uh, they're, they're the two saying, halves this have is, nothing to do with each other. It's this a, is what so your animals want. And we you do. either hate the first half and think the second one half's acceptable, or you're totally into it. Oh, and so no one's just happy. The final well, that, frontier 19 times. I don't know. Oh, oh Matt, oh, Matt seems funny. happy. You're, it's, it's supposed it's, to be no one's happy. Don't you remember, like, at the end of Kill Bill, where, where he's, he's talking about Superman, and, like, Superman is himself. He's not wearing a costume. Clark Kent, it is his costume, and it's his parody of us humans. This is Iron Maiden parodying all Iron Maiden fans. This is their ripping... Gu- they're smashing our spacesuits with this glowing hammer and exposing us to the godless vacuum of space. <laughs> yeah. Oh, both it's, it's scientifically designed to please no one and it's brilliant. Great. Both this and the next track El Dorado have like 
comic book uh, single covers. That, you know, that's with true, like yeah. Iron Maiden, England, number 15. You know, and then like El Dorado. They, uh, they look like they look like something uh, um, Kirk Hammett would collect. Yes, 100%. That's a ding. <laughs> no, this is White Zombie the movie, not the band. 30s movie. <laughs> well, that's think that. By the way, have you ever seen that movie? No, is not good? Those people in the 30s must have had an attention span long enough to listen to these new Iron Maiden albums. <laughs> Very slow, very thing. slow movie. Okay, so uh, can you talk about the cover. I, I oh well, yeah, we did, yeah, we, we we glossed over. So that. this is um Mervin, what's his name? The, it's the same guy who did uh, Virtual Eleven and Fear of the Dark. It's it's good. Uh, I I think um, Mark Wilkinson, who's the Judas Priest artist, actually really ups the artwork uh, to another level on the next two records, but. <sighs> Uh, compared to Dance of Death, which is his most comparable to, this is a great cover. I will it's say, I've, I've always found this packaging questionable, and I hate the um, yeah. the reverse Star Wars scroll of the of the songs. <laughs> yeah, that's the wrong way. I'd, I'd be curious if they did a full sleeve uh, picture, if it's just the uh, the one panel. So I'll, I'll go spend thirty four ninety five on the vinyl to find out. Um, <laughs> all right, I, I really like El Dorado too. Again, doesn't sound like Iron Maiden. No, it doesn't sound like Iron Maiden. Um, it's again, it's one of <clears throat> two and a half good songs on this album. Um, or I mean, decent songs on the album. It's not. I mean, it's not bad. It it probably is the real like non non psyop opening track, right? If, yeah. if 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 track one is a psyop against everyone who loves Iron Maiden and or hates Iron Maiden, um, this is the real beginning of the album. I, I think. Would you say it's good enough to win a Grammy for the best metal performance? Well, it was when it was Barracuda. <laughs> I mean, I well, thought like well, it won a Grammy. Okay, a heart <laughs> cover. That's pretty in- inventive. Yeah, it is exactly that. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I uh, the, the song, the lyrics are actually about the Great Recession. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Matt, forgive my historical ignorance. El Dorado, mythical place. Oh, that yeah, means El Dorado who, myth. It was, it was the uh, the Spanish conquistadors uh, were looking for El Dorado. It's this famed city of gold somewhere in Man, who, Mexico or the southwest or somewhere. It must have been so easy to fool the conquistadors. Yeah, oh, yeah. we found a youth over there and a city of gold over there. You know, drink I his chocolate. I feel like it was like <laughs> the, the Billy Goats gruff. Where they, they were like, oh, uh, yeah, you could invade our town, but you know, like over those mountains is a much more fabulous and rich town. You may as well, you know, leave, leave. We'll give you some corn, but really, if you're looking for stuff to plunder, you should, you should be going up those mountains. They call it El Dorado. Uh, all right. Yeah. I, I, uh, I like that song. Uh, and, our, here's maybe where it gets contentious. I like Mother of Mercy too. Oh, this is uh, this oh. where it was going to go over the cliff for me. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I unfortunately, we, I have to part company with uh, my com- comrade Doug here. Uh, I, I love the first person parts and Bruce Dickinson's weird accent as he does that groove <laughs> talking. Okay, that, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that that makes it a, a, a good. You know, it's no. It's no Nico playing the China symbol. Uh, it's definitely <laughs> memorable, though. <laughs> um, it, I, I couldn't... Now, I will say that it, this is the shortest track on the album. Uh, second shortest track, so I appreciated that. Um, there's lots of weird stuff going on here. Um, I didn't quite get... 
the, this this happens a lot. This is where the first track I noticed it, but they're they're increasingly you know maybe it's this production thing that you were talking about, Tim. The vocals and the music become decoupled. It yes. really gets bad during um, the Book of Souls, but but here there's almost like it's not a sync error error. It's just. Bruce is not singing with the final musical piece together. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> no, it's well, well, my, my that, favorite that might part be like of all alive. of these songs is how all the lead guitar and all the solos just feel pasted in and nothing yeah. like the music. Well, yeah, it's it's just like, well, we have this and we have this. I guess they go together. Like, there's even like... Now we we should also talk about this. This is the first noticeable album where Bruce's pipes are uh, not great, um, and so his le- his range is much more limited. I don't know if there's like a story behind that, but <laughs> was it after just, this it, album? When when did it happen, Doug? The throat cancer. Yeah, he had throat cancer. <laughs> Oh, after, oh, after the recording of Book of Souls. So, yeah, so, okay. it was well, so I don't know when it actually developed. There might, there might be a polyp in there. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> I, I uh, see, he's someone I, uh, because if you, if you want something gruff and gritty, Blaze could have done that. But I do have to give him credit. I think he sounds pretty good on all the records going forward still in kind of a grittier, you know, what he was trying to do. In fear of the dark and no prayer, okay. a little bit. He, he was doing it to be obnoxious then. Now that's what he sounds like. <laughs> hmm. um, yeah. So, for what it is, I really like this song. Oh, I, I have to call out. There is one line, and I'm going to try and find the review. But there's a there's a line that pissed some metal archives person off to <laughs> oh. <laughs> the point where they have to write like. What is it? It's a line about I don't hold with bad religion. And the reviewer could not accept that this character could differentiate between good and bad religion. <laughs> this this mercenary. Wow. Uh, this person looking for something to get him through this horrible war. Was that a good uh, review or a bad, like a positive review or a, a probably negative? <laughs> just, I, just, actually, there's quite a few negatives in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah th- th- this was their probably their worst received record of the last six. Uh, there's still a a 100 percent review. Oh, it's a uh, it's thank God it wasn't the end written by Diesel Eleven. Oh no! I was. I'm reading "Unexpected" by Freeze. Uh, one of the most impressive things about this record is the multi-texturing of the sound that was barely hearable on previous records. Hearable spelled H-E-R-E-able. By the way, um, instead oh, like- of just repeating the same riffs on all three guitars, one can often hear those small nuances that add so much to the song. So, hundred uh- percent. Uh, the worst line on the entire album and one of Maiden's worst ever is Mercy's dumbass thing. I don't okay. hold with bad religion. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? <laughs> How do you separate good religion from bad religion? I'm so confused the goddamn thing won't explain itself. Ugh. Well, every that, every yeah. punk everywhere is like, their head's exploding. Yeah. <laughs> And maybe God will tell him what religion is to man, Doug. Yeah, well, you can go to war and figure out which who he's talking to. I just and real how quick that works out. Gask Mask Col- Colostomy writes, you know oh, about a million cop movies or sports movies when the hero has gone into retirement after a long and successful career, then when a new challenger stronger than any before rises up to challenge the field, they step back out of retirement and muster one last effort to defeat the threat? That's what Iron Maiden should be doing, except they haven't retired and thus can't muster up one last shot at glory. <laughs> <laughs> Give that right. man a ding. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's get back to 
Okay. Track list so, coming home. I have less to say about this because it's not s- exceptionally stupid. I I know some people like this song. It's fine. It's if you like, like airplane power ballads. It's like the it's like it's 30 years after the wasted years <laughs> and it's just like the tired diptych <laughs> to it, I guess. And who's Albion? I see Bruce Dickinson needs to show he went to college, unlike Steve Harris. So, so Albion <laughs> is England. Uh, Albion seed. Um, it's it's I, the White Cliffs of Dover, basically. This must be. Th- this might be like <laughs> the worst thing I could say about <laughs> these songs, and this one, and Mother of Mercy. It's just like I don't care. They don't elicit anything in me. Yeah. I, uh, apathy is the is the true opposite of love and hatred. So it's true. It's very true. Yep. So uh I, like, I don't care. It, it, it just seems phoned in. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna super defend that one. I will defend the Alchemist. Which Alchemist is, great. is a good song. Yeah, Alchemist yeah. has a good He's singing yeah, about I, scrolls. I, I realize this is a uh, <laughs> this is an audio medium, <laughs> so just doing my fist isn't yeah. isn't really conveying it. But yeah, it has a good uh, groove feel to it, energy, and uh, it's based on a real person, John. Oh, some D. kind of alchemist. Oh, John D is a very famous uh, English alchemist and magician. Uh, oh, that's interesting. But uh, and I, I guess I know. Uh, but is alchemy is literally in its purest form, just turning lead into gold? I believe which, so. But you can't do right. <clears throat> well, I mean that's that's kind of the crude well, version of alchemy. I mean, you could do it. You just need like so, a particle accelerator to change the number of uh, protons and neutrons. I mean, alchemy, and I suppose, is is basically various uh pre like pre-modern pre-scientific okay. explorations of metals learning about properties um so so i mean it's 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 not purely it, it was much more about learning about medicine and how materials work and and quests for power and immortality and kind of universal um you, you know omnipotence basically so you know I think turning lead into gold is kind of a, a a good metaphor for it. Basically, it's like the the cold fusion, or this this theoretically obtainable but never obtainable thing. I mean, I think it's I think it's a good alchemy. I mean, it, it's it's literally like a, a derivative, right? Like alchemy is to chemistry as astrology is to astronomy, right? So, like, we, we moderns don't want to admit that a lot of the motivations that led to all our scientific discoveries, like, for example, are Kepler uh, and Copernicus made their discoveries because they wanted to make their astrological tables better. Like, we, we forget that part, right? But it, it's, this, it's this, this, like, pre-modern understanding of the universe um, that's dealing with natural elements and materials and things, and so a lot of work that informed early modern chemistry is alchemy, right? And, and a lot of like Arab science and, and Roman and Greek science was very much alchemy, you know, Chinese Indian science. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's John D is a, is a, an important figure in the history of alchemy and the history. We might ruin that one, right. Uh, in the history of science. Um, I, I think he had already invented the term British empire. He he did invent the term British Empire. He was uh, an Elizabethan. Um, yeah, no. So he's an interesting guy. Yeah, it's a good four minute <sighs> comic booky song about him. Yeah. All right, on to Isle of Avalon, which I'll merely this this says the weed base syndrome kind of the most. This is yeah. the turn. This is where the turn happens. This is the whole back. I. I'll just save all of our time and say the whole back of this record is too many repeats. 
Too much nothing. Mm -hmm. Bad songwriting. They could have cut all these songs in half and tightened them up. <laughs> y yes. And the song I, lengths on this back half are nine minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, eight and a half minutes, 11 minutes. You can literally see where the good idea polished songs ended and the, well, I guess we'll throw that on the album. I guess uh, that's done. <laughs> yeah, I, the the lyrics are, I mean, it's Avalon, the mythical Art, Arthurian place yeah. uh it's fine it's two it's it's three minutes too long and the the bass just overwhelms the random guitar solos that are <laughs> obligatorily placed in the center of the song might be six minutes too long but i i generally <laughs> agree with that um no, i i really like starblind I, I i like portions of starblind <laughs> i i, I uh, I've re I've read these lyrics so many times because I was trying to figure out if it was based on the obscure Canadian TV show The Star Lost. Is it? I don't think so, but Damn. but that that was the whole um uh for the world is hollow, but I've seen the sky premise. People want uh... a uh, uh, the, and uh, religion is controlling them and I think the practitioners of religion forgot that that was their point and they all just believe in this. And then a guy, see, I've only run the Davilization. I, I hear the TV show is actually shit, but, you know, <laughs> that the protagonist rejects their god and then finds a hole into the actual spaceship and finds astronauts. And, oh, this isn't a planet. We're on a, on a spaceship. And, and this song kind of uh, captures that kind of vibe. And the lyrics are very kind of comic booky, evocative. Okay, uh, and the, it's got a great chorus, if I recall, and more shitty random guitar solos. Uh, yeah, uh, it's 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 something. Uh, I'm 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 not that much of a fan of it, but yeah, it's. it's, it's I think they're it's in the middle funny. of the song. There's like a a rejected riff from Load. Yeah. <laughs> yes, this is kind of like a waste basket where a lot of. 2000s musical ideas ended up for some reason. All right, next is the Talisman. Talisman. Uh, the Sting song? Talisman. <laughs> like, there are so many. There, I can think off the top. I'm a, for the record, I'm a huge Sting fan. Um, there are like a dozen Sting songs about going out to sea that all begin like this, <laughs> that all have this. Uh, just meandering, leaving the coast kind of feel. But then, like, at the halfway mark, um, instead of turning into whatever the fuck this is, they turn into an interesting musical experience. Um, <laughs> this is just like, we'll have a Sting opening, like solo album Sting, like like 2000 solo album Sting, uh, but then just put a, a, a weird ass half written Iron Maiden song at the end. <laughs> Which is probably why I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but it should be the last song on the record. Yes, yeah, okay. I, I, it, it should be the last song on the record. It is a. I, I love when Doug and I are on the same way. Like, this is the closer of the album. It should be an eight track album. <laughs> um,. This is the end of the album. This is the end of the idea. I don't think idea. you can get this one on eight track. Uh, I mean, I don't think it, I don't that, think this one will fit thing. on eight track. Yeah, what, what you people will buy their vinyl, their cassette, and their eight track, eight track. and then <laughs> actually list everything on Spotify. Can Eisenmore please release on eight track? It's going to be the next big thing. Um, there are people well, releasing I, new eight tracks. Yes. You have to accept that this whole album is kind of fucking with you. And if you look okay. at it from that perspective, it's pretty good. <laughs> okay. And, and, but I also like the parallel with space and, and voyaging. It, it's, uh, it fits. It's fine. It's not my least favorite song. I'm annoyed that I'm annoyed at the disparity. I feel like transition blend do something rather than just like fall off the cliff but unfortunately 
then we get to the man who would be yeah. king. Which is a man of war lyric. About the future uh, the Prince of Wales, who uh, is now king. Uh, is this a, I know it's a Sean Connery movie, but is it a Rupert Kipling story or something? I don't think this has anything to do with anything. Steve Harris just remembers the, yeah, the phrase. It, it, it is a Richard Kipling. Um, it's like another, it's, what is it? Like a British army adventure kind of rom- imperial romantic. Is is that a good term for it? I, I don't know that the lyrics have much to do with anything. It is a great example of Steve Harris likes movies. Um, I, I think it's about someone killing someone and then getting away with it, which somehow takes eight and a half minutes to not convey. The The film follows two rogue ex-soldiers, former non-commissioned officers in the British Army, who set off from late 19th century British India in search of adventure and end up in faraway Kafiristan, um, which is in Afghanistan, where one is taken for a god and made their king. So I I guess he just took the the title. Yeah. The lyrics don't really match that at all. (sighs) Uh, Yeah, I have written that it's stupid and boring, and I have nothing else to add. Correct. Although... Compared to the last album or last uh, track of the album, uh, it's uh, fucking brilliant <laughs> and uh, musical genius. <laughs> All right, on to <laughs> when the wild wind blows. When the wild thing winds wind blows. So this is based on a British movie <laughs> with a cult appeal that it's kind of uh, kind of like their day after. Okay. Um, and uh, the plot of it is uh, a couple's preparing for the end. Uh, they hear it on TV, et cetera. They're very prepared. And then an earthquake happens. And I think they commit suicide as a result of the earthquake, thinking it's the nuclear holocaust. Yep. Uh, and it takes. Uh, 11 minutes to get there. I, I will say <laughs> I don't hate this song as much as I should. <laughs> Man, I, I thought I thought you were going to I thought this album was going to be derided more than it is. Well, I mean, I, I feel like I feel like it's getting a lot of lucky breaks. Um this song, the way it's sung, the way it's constructed is infuriating. Now, I think I was much angrier at When the Wild Wind Blows before I listened to Book of Souls. Um, So I think that's also uh, a hindsight issue. But it's it's just... (laughs) Make this a bonus track. Make this a B-side. This does not belong on an album, let alone as the closer of an album. It's an interesting uh, premise. It's an interesting little toy, musical toy, uh, playing around. Uh, It's uh, uh, uh. it's almost as long as the movie, which is only eighty four (laughs) minutes. Yeah, you could listen to the song twice and just. (laughs) And and so the movie, it is British. It's co-British Japanese. Uh, It's from nineteen eighty six. I thought it was in the seventies. And is it animated? It's animated. I, I just put the link or the name in our chat. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th- I think it was well received as a cult following. So again, it's it's maybe the last. Uh, it was reviewed in White Dwarf. Okay, so okay. everyone knows their audience. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's All the right. last movie Steve Harris saw. All right. Well, that's the. <laughs> End of the album. Let's throw a number on this. What did Dance uh, of Death end up with? Dance of Death had a five. All right. I can't go lower than a six on this, unfortunately. I can. <laughs> I, uh, this is a... This is a five. This is this a is five. A three is what it is. So am I putting it at five? Six, five, as long and three? As long as it's higher than Dance of Death. 
It's tied with Dance of Death. That's fine. I, I, five, I can live with that. I think it's 5.5. 5. This has more good or stupid good songs than Dance <laughs> stupid of Death. Good. Uh, you know, <laughs> he's right. He's right. 5.5. 5. There's, there's only another one. 5. 5. There isn't one. Okay. There's only one Renaissance Festival uh, song. I think that. Uh, <laughs> I think that so, wraps it up for those two albums. So finally, in our next episode, we're going oh. to get to the last two albums, which you know, Tim, are both the longest albums. I think we've run out of uh, digital recording space, so maybe we'll just have to skip uh, those two um, ent- entirely. <laughs> If you want to know where the song Dance of Death comes from, look for a future podcast and down fan fiction recording on the Patreon. <laughs> and uh, radio yeah, that, play. That'll be out in June sometime, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, instead of my usual closing, I'm just going to quote another review. <laughs> quote, Bruce doing that annoying voice straining thing voice straining accenting that no one really likes a lot and steve proving to the world that he's a completely spent force as a songwriter until next time metal nation Cast. i like the strained voice personally it's cancer <laughs> jeez